what I'm going to do is post all the questions that have been asked thus far. So that way you go, oh, I know what's going to be asked. They're going to cover this one. But if you have more, put them in the bottom. And then we will try to answer them, hopefully, in the order that they come in. If not, it's up to, to how we're going to kind of approach this. But I promise you, anything posted, anything that we've got is going to get answered. If it is not within this 50 minutes, this group has committed to answer them uh, offline in the session right after this. And so both videos will be submitted and posted on our social channels. So you will have access to those. Um, so what I do wanna say is welcome everybody to the Bridge Club. I see lots of familiar faces um, and several people that were on here from yesterday, but it is really my obligation to, to let you know that the Bridge Club is very unique. We are all about connecting, engaging, learning, and growing together, uh, and that this is a unique bridge club. Typically, we do not mute you all, but we have muted you uh, as a reason because we want to make sure all questions and all answers uh, get answered today. Um, so as we go through, we're making sure that we're keeping this succinct. Um, so uh, we're going to be having a moderator helping us move through, and we will be trying to make sure we get to as many questions as possible. So again, put everything into the chat today as we do it. As is tradition with the Bridge Club, because I want to get us to our message. Um, first of all, I do want us to make sure you all have a beverage that you are raising in. And then I'm going to, before I introduce who all of our, uh, our speakers are today, our hosts, um, I want to start us with a toast. And I'm going to turn to Dr. Seuss today. Oh, and Joy's got her mug. I love it. Um, so... <laughs> We turn to Dr. Seuss uh, for some inspiration. He says, sometimes the questions are complicated and the answers are simple. So today, let's toast to hearing these brave souls answer our tough questions. So there we go, everyone, cheers. Yeah, cheers. We have a great panel today. We've got uh, the VNI uh, working group as well as some great guests that joined us from yesterday. So I do wanna have uh, Patricia Zena raise her hand so everyone can see her, there she is. And then we have Katie Waddell, if you can raise your hand, fantastic. We have Heather Pentergast, uh, great, she's waving. Ed Carlson, waving. And then we have Ken, and I'm not even gonna try. Ken, I'm not gonna mention your, I'm, I just will mess up your last name. And then our illustrious moderator today is gonna be Mark Cushing, as well as the Animal Policy Group has sponsored this session. And we want to thank Mark and his entire team uh, for, oh, Allie, Allie's on here somewhere too. Uh, thank you, Allie, uh, for their great support of the Bridge Club. And as you know, our job here is to bring the industry together, talk about really important things. So Mark, I'm gonna turn this over to you and I'm gonna put in the questions. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, hope everybody can hear me well. If you see me look off camera, the questions are on my iPhones. Uh, I'm not a split screen artist like I'm sure most of you are. So the questions have been uh, captured as written. In a few cases, we shorten them not to lose the point of the question, but just to make it easier to, to read and for folks to understand. And the way we're gonna work here is I'll read the question out loud. In some cases, I'm able to answer it because it's pretty matter of fact or it's, or it's a legal question or specifically a legislative question. Uh, but in most cases, I'll be pulling in uh, Ken Yagi, Ed Carlson, Heather Pendergrass, or uh, Katie or Patricia, depending on if the question seems to be aimed at the, uh, the con or the critics of the VNI initiative as opposed to the working group. Lots of questions. I'm not sure there's anything about the initiative that won't be covered. So let me jump in. First question in the first, oops, Catherine has oh, a- Yes, point. apparently I'm having trouble pasting in the questions. So I'm gonna be working with Brenda offline to figure out how to do that while we're listening. So if you don't see us looking, that's what we're that's doing. The, I've grouped these under categories. So the first category is title change, which is a topic that was a subject of a, much discussion yesterday. The first question is, why add the level of complexity of a title change with the accompanying trouble with nurses associations rather than focus on RVT or registered veterinary technician as a universal standard for the whole continent? Ken Yagi, if you could uh, take that question. Um, yeah, so you guys can hear me okay. Uh, so. Um, from our standpoint, uh, changing the title actually isn't all that complex in terms of uh, if you take a look at the 
legislative amendment that we have to make in that um, it's uh, basically just uh, taking what's in the Practice Act and substituting what says veterinary technician to veterinary nurse at the moment. And so uh, in terms of a, a bill change, uh, it's not that complex. Definitely, I think the um, level of um, challenge that comes from nursing associations that may come out in opposition for it uh, is the, the key point that I think that the person asking this question is trying to uh, get at. And their sole argument is uh, basically that um, uh, the term nurse, by definition, refers to uh, people uh, to describe people who provide nursing care for people and no other species. And so the question is, do you agree with that? And does do the legislators agree with that? And it seems like uh, as we're going through with this, um, the votes are going in the way that uh, the legislators don't buy that argument. And so um, we're uh, very hopeful that, that we can continue moving by being able to convince people that nursing care is nursing care and it does apply to us. And uh, uh, okay. <laughs> it, we'll keep going because there's a lot of questions, different ways of ans asking about the title change. And sure. we should share with the audience the suggestion that's been made from some quarters of the nursing association as to what a different name could be is a, is a name veterinary practitioner, which V and I, and I think virtually anybody involved in, in veterinary care would agree that the term veterinary practitioner would raise complications and issues way beyond the term nurse if that were to be substituted. So that was not, that recommendation by nurses has not been adopted. The, other question that, that ties in here is that the VNI focuses on both title change and credentialing at the same time. The person writes, I keep hearing that the VNI is about more than a title change, but the first states targeted are only a title change. Why is that? Ken? Uh, so, um, as we probably know, the goals of the BNI are to standardize our uh, profession's credentials um, regarding the credentialing requirement, defining the scope of practice, instituting title protection, um, and uh, you know getting our title to be really recognized. And so, uh, it's definitely a lot more than just a title change. Um, but uh, when we come to the first phase of our um, activity, those legislative activity, uh, it is just that. Um, the only thing that we're doing in that state regarding the bill is to substitute veterinary technician to veterinary nurse because states like Ohio already do have um, a standard credential requirement that we agree with, that, that they do have a somewhat defined scope of practice uh, and they do have title protection language within their laws already. So all in those states, all we have to do is change the title and that's why it looks that way. But going forward, if there are states that have other pieces of it that um, is missing, then we're going to be putting that into uh, the bills that we put forward as well. And uh, the other thing that I'll mention uh, very quickly, the scope of practice is something that actually should stay out of the Practice Act. And that's the recommendation that's being made by various professions, AABSB. And so we're working with them to come up with a model rules and regulation uh, document, which will um, outline the scope of practice better. And we'll be reaching out to you guys to get more feedback regarding that as the process moves forward this year. Thanks, Ken. And I think everybody should understand that when you say it should come out of the Practice Act, it means rather than the state legislature, which obviously is composed rarely with any veterinarians or vet techs and, and just general members of the public, it would be dropped to the level or placed at the level of the boards of veterinary medicine. And the boards of veterinary medicine in all states pass rules that implement laws and the suggestion would be at that level, it's appropriate to, to spell out the scope of practice. The next question I'm going to answer, and it's a question that comes up all the time, and there's a great deal of confusion. So uh, I believe we can put the confusion to rest right now. Question, do human nurses have title protection, and is this the barrier to change our name? And the answer is, what human nurses have is under the boards of nursing, 
within the scope of the boards of nursing, which govern human health care use of nurses. Within that scope, so picture that like a box, within that box of human health delivered by nurses, the boards have specified what's required to be licensed at different levels of nursing, RN and various levels above that. And you're all familiar with that. There is nothing within the statutes or the rules that provide human nurses any ownership or any protection whatsoever outside the box of human health care delivery, meaning that the authority of the boards of nursing and their statutes do not extend one inch into, area, into the area of care of animals, period. And there is a myth that nurses own the name. They don't. There's no trademark owned by the nurses of the word nurse. You can tell your friends that you're nursing a cold and not be afraid that you're violating the ownership rights of nurses. And they have no authority into the veterinary or animal care world. So it is not a barrier to the use of the term registered veterinary nurse. And that's important for people to appreciate. Next question, how will a title change increase vet tech utilization? Or in this, excuse me, in this case, veterinary nurse utilization. Ken, would you like to answer that please? Yeah, um, so the, the most uh, simplest answer to that is that uh, it doesn't, um, it doesn't directly at least. Um, but uh, again, um, I think this question is asked because uh, we see the vet nurse initiative as whether it's uh, about the title change or not about the title change. And that, that's where we're still having this conversation. So we really have to stop pretending that the VNI is just about the title change. It's not. It's also about defining the scope of practice, delineating the roles between um, RVNs and assistants and who's credentialed and not credentialed. And uh, by being able to clarify that much better, it's going to drive better utilization within the veterinary team. And that's what the VNI is about. So, so that's how it's connected. Question, have those that are working on the VNI investigated the term nurse on an international level? And does it cover all areas that US technicians cover? Ken, and, and Ed, you spoke to this yesterday. So if you wanna add anything to Ken's uh, answer, feel free, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I um, interpreted this question as um, uh, do veterinary nurses in other countries, um, are they equivalent to what veterinary technicians are in the United States? And um, there's definitely differences in scope of practice uh, or tasks that they can perform, such as the UK nurses uh, not being able to invade body cavities so they can't perform cystosynthesis or you know, the little things that are a little bit different from country to country. But we did take a look at um, the general uh, scope of uh, what the uh, veterinary nurse does in each of the countries, and um, we feel it's similar enough. But first of all, um, what we're interested in as VNI is to get the U.S. Uh, credentialed and uh, standardized, and that's what we're focusing on first, and then we can look a little bit more outward. Thank you, Ken. One of the questions that came out of yesterday's discussion was a phrase that Ed uh, Carlson used in talking about legislatures. You begin in a few states and then ultimately um, a domino effect occurs where states across the country get in line with the changes that are made by the first group of states and you use the phrase domino effect. The question asked was, what is the thought process regarding this domino effect, especially where nurses claim the title of nurse is protected what is that fight going to cost? And I'm gonna answer that question. The Animal Policy Group, we work in the area of public policy, legislation and regulations affecting animal health broadly, animal welfare in particular in the veterinary world. So that's the world I work in, which is why we were asked to help with this initiative because it's focused on changing practice acts and legislatures. And here's what that means and I'll address the cost issue. The nursing association at the national level has directed state nursing associations to oppose this. It's important to understand that it's not necessarily what a state nursing association wants to do in one particular state as much as they were told by their national group 
to oppose this for the reasons that Ken has outlined and Ed outlined yesterday. Namely, they don't want anybody else using the phrase nurse. So what the domino effect means is this. This year we're in Ohio and Indiana and Georgia, and there'll be a group of states next year. Once the legislatures make this change and recognize the term re registered veterinary nurse and the public broadly legislators in other states understand that the nurses only objection is that they think they own the name and no one else can use it. Um, once, once we're successful, what typically happens is many states jump in and say, we can make that change as well. And it becomes much easier and much less complicated. And therefore the expense is less. Um, it, it, the cost in legislate in, in, in getting legislatures in a particular state by hiring a lobbyist in those state capitals can be around $60,000, roughly five or $6,000 a month to retain a lobbyist in Columbus, Ohio, and Indianapolis, Indiana, and Atlanta, Georgia, and then you move across the country. But, but once the nurses realize, A, that human nursing hasn't been harmed, and B, that legislatures are getting in line, you're gonna see what Ed referred to as a domino effect where other legislatures say we can do this and it's much less complicated and the level of effort by NAVTA, the BNI and, and the industry to push this uh, is much, much lessened. So you can't put an exact dollar amount on that, but that's what the typical practice is. Not that it's gonna take 10, 15, 20 years, two states a year to make that change. Um, in the same area of title protection, then we'll move on to another topic. The question is, how exactly will the title change increase our pay in the industry and what steps will be taken to change the way we are compensated? Again, Ken, I'm going to ask you, and then I'll give you a break in the next category. But Ken, if you could answer that, and Ed, you spoke to this yesterday. If you want to f add anything to Ken's answer, please feel free. Sorry, this was about compensation? Yeah, the question was, how would a title change to registered veterinary nurse increase pay and what steps are being taken to, uh, to change the way vet techs are compensated? Yeah, um, so this is one, another one of those where um, the title change itself uh, isn't an overnight change that'll change the, the pay of the veterinary technicians or then called veterinary nurses. Um, and so, uh, so the title change portion isn't necessarily directed directly at changing compensation. But with that said, again, the vet nurse initiative is not just a title change. There's all sorts of things going into it that addresses different areas of challenges that we have. And so by being able to better define the scope of practice, being able to educate the community, uh, the veteran community, as well as the public through the initiative is going to create a better awareness of the role that we play. Um, we'll, we're already talking about different kinds of ways that uh, our profession should, how our profession should um, function within the veterinary team that would lead to better profitability of the uh, practices, uh, higher demand from the public regarding uh, having qualified individuals working on their pets, and all that is going to drive um, the value of the profession up, which will eventually uh, lead to that, that increase. And, all sorts of pressures uh, working on that as well. One thing that I want to mention that uh, I think people don't um, see as much is if you go to the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, website and take a look at the veteran technology, uh, veteran technician and veteran technologist um, wage uh, report that, that they have annually updated, they, we have a chart that compares us to other animal, or I'm sorry, other healthcare technicians and technologists, which is about an average of 43,000 a year, and we're at about 60 or 36,000 a year. And so we're being compared to people who are classified as technicians that have a smaller scope of practice within the, the human medical field. And that that makes it look like, oh yeah, we're paid a little bit less, but we really should be being compared to people who perform a nursing care role in human medicine and drawing that comparison. And so even the, just that change is going to change public perception. Thanks, Ken. Um, and I'll keep this moving. We have a long list. So uh, 
Uh, if I ever cut anybody off, it's only because I want to get on to the next topic. I'm going to move now to the area of lobbying efforts in particular states, and Ed Carlson will take those questions. That will be followed by a question a lot of folks have had regarding the financial support for the uh, Veterinary Nurse Initiative and um, who is, uh, the amounts of money that have been contributed, and Heather Prendergrass uh, will take the lead there. So Ed, uh, in, in balmy, sunny Massachusetts, it looks like the sun's coming through your window. We're happy to see that, uh, or unless that's artificial light. Um, I'm going to throw a few questions your way, please. Um, question, what is the status of Ohio and what other states are being pursued by VNI in 2019? Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, it is uh, natural light that's reflecting off all of the snow that we got last night, which is making it even a little bit brighter. So thanks for that. Uh, so yeah, I think I kind of covered this yesterday, but um, kind of to recap just briefly, um, in Ohio, there was some kind of political upheaval that really had nothing to do with the VNI at all. Um, and not only the VNI, but other bills uh, took a back seat to some political posturing, for lack of a better terminology, I guess. Uh, so we were very successful within the House and did pass out of the House. However, ran out of time in the course of the political year for that actually to get moved into debate in the Senate. Uh, so that bill is being refiled um, for 2019. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, Indiana is one of the states that we are uh, moving forward in in 2019 and had a nice win uh, Monday out of the Agriculture um, Committee. Um, so that's moving forward um, and doing well there. Um, and Georgia is another state that has been targeted as um, a state that will be uh, working closely with the Veterinary Technician Association as well as the Veterinary Medical Association um, within that state um, with that bill being filed there as well. Thanks, Ed. A, a couple of things will... Uh... Hey, Mark, oh. real quick before you continue, I just want to jump in really quick. I know people are looking at the list of questions and wondering how were these questions created, et cetera. These were submitted to us in advance. Um, we promise all questions will be answered. Some people are indicating it feels very one-sided of an issue, and we want to make sure that we are being balanced, but these were questions directed at the, the Veterinary Nurse Initiative. So I do want to be sure if you have a question, so to help us out here just a little bit because we're a startup, is actually post a question versus just the comments. So if you have something and we will get to it, I promise you we will, um, but we had the initial questions on the front end. So I just want to be sure that everyone understands how this was kind of pulled together. We asked on all of our social channels for questions and we put it in the, the uh, promotion that we put out as well. So. Um, please be patient with us. We'll get to him. Mark's running through them as fast as he possibly can. Um, and then we will continue on to the next one. So I just want to make sure we said that. Sorry, Mark, just to put that out there. No, Catherine, that's great. And, and these questions, they're not being edited. And you could tell the vast number came in as questions to the Veterinary Nurse Initiative, which frankly was the purpose in large part of the Bridge Club effort here is to allow people that wanted to pose questions to understand it a convenient way to get those answered so it, it, it we're not weighing questions and assigning them one way or the other so let me give people some timeline expectations to add to ed's point in ohio and indiana and georgia we would expect the activity to be the most intense in february march and possibly some slipping into april where so it's the first part of the year where we expect that decisions will be made by the House and the Senate and ultimately uh, by the governors in those states to change the, the title as, as Ken and Ed have described. Next question. I was told at the NAPTA meeting that the wording in the Ohio bill would be what is introduced in all states. Is this true? I think Ken already explained that, that the three states right now are states that have credentials for uh, registered in Indiana, registered in Ohio, licensed vet techs in, in Georgia that are a combination of AVMA accredited degree and passage of the VTNE exam administered by the AAVSB. And so the legislation in each state 
isn't addressing the basis of credentials, it's addressing the title name itself because the credentials are common. And, and, and I think Ken made that point. So Ed, the question for you is, can we see the wording of the bills being introduced is it just adding in the title veterinary nurse or are they truly adding in wording for title protection, standards of education, et cetera? Ed, if you want to comment on that. Sure. Um, so yes, all bills that are being introduced um, in any state are, are public record um, and are very easy to find with a quick Google search um, within that state. Um, I don't have uh, any of the numbers in, in front of me, I'm afraid. Um, um, bills that were filed last year will have a new bill number for this year, but again, that's very easy information to, to find online. Um, and to kind of take Mark's point to the last question as part of that, answering this one as well, um, a little bit further in that, yes, we are going to see the bills have different language dependent upon what is already in that state's practice act. <laughs> And rules and regulations. So, as we just mentioned, currently it is looking at um, just a title change within those states because we don't need to make additional changes um, within those, those state laws. Um, however, as we move into other states, there will be other wording that does address things like title protection and standards of education, et cetera. Thanks, Ed. Now we'll move to the topic of financial uh support for the vni and how the money is spent and heather prendergrass will take the the bulk of these questions the first one is it's, it's, it's two questions together does the vni have a budget can the vni provide an audited accounting of what was what has been spent and a budget of what's proposed to be spent going forward heather the VINI does have a budget. It is something that we've put together and proposed uh, to the NAFTA board for approval before we chose the states that we would move forward in. So we do have a, a budget and we also have a, um, you know, the timeline of the money that's spent as well as the sponsorship dollars that come in. And yes, we will provide that in an overall spreadsheet in the resources that follow this, um, this chat. Thanks, Heather. Question, how are the lobbyists paid? Salary, hourly charged by state? All of our lobbyists are hired by state. So there's different lobbyists that work for each state that is familiar with the state's uh, rules and regulations and processes within their own House and Senate. So we pay each state lobbyist on a monthly basis. Okay, and question, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just tell people that the amount per month per lobbyist, which is how lobbyists are paid in each of the state capitals we're working in is $6,000 a month. So four to five to six months of work is somewhere between $24,000 and $36,000 per state. And that's a, a, a good level of fee to pay for something like this. It's less than some, other, some things and more than others. Um, if the VNI does not succeed in title change in all 50 states, does a lobbyist still receive payment? And I would expect, Heather, that that's aimed at the animal policy group. And we charge $7,500 per month to the organization to oversee and run the whole project. And you can answer that question if you want. Absolutely. And, and you know, I kind of take this back into general practice with us working with our clients. We may be working on a patient that doesn't survive, but because that patient doesn't survive doesn't mean that, that we're not going to charge the client for the services that were provided. And this is the very same situation, just um, a kind of a, a little bit of a different profession. So absolutely, whether we make it in that state or not. And, you know, there's there's so many things that that it's not the support of uh, it's la it's not lack of support that we have in those states. It's usually other political ties or things that are going on within a state that have nothing to do with the veterinary nurse initiative that prolongs uh, some of these um, agendas, much like what had happened in Ohio, as Ed had explained. The other thing I'll point out working in this field is that it is a felony for a lobbyist to be paid only if they win in 48 states. So um, we're not interested in, in violating any laws so you can't have an agreement that says unless all 50 states do something you won't be paid 
Next question, is the initiative funded only through donations? The initiative is funded through sponsorships uh, by people that wish to contribute to the veterinary nurse initiative and uh, the sponsorships versus donations is important. Where is the money coming from? We have sponsorships that have come from uh, corporations. We have uh, sponsorships that have come uh, from our members. It is um, the up to the sponsorships or, and the companies that have sponsored if they wish to release the total amount of dollars that they have sponsored for the Veterinary Nurse Initiative. Um, but as far as the members, we have not used NAFTA funds and dues um, for the Veterinary Nurse Initiative, but rather we put out a call if you wish to donate uh, for the Veterinary Nurse Initiative, then the members could donate for that. Heather, can you either list now or tell people where to go so they can see the list of the companies or organizations, not the NAPTA members, but the organizations that have sponsored the VNI? Absolutely. So the any sponsor that has come in, whether it's a position statement or if they have uh, provided funds can be found on the veterinary nurse um, website, veterinarynurse.org. And um, every time somebody contributes or has interest or has an immediate a position statement, we post that immediately. I don't know if you can answer this, uh, but the question is why are they referring to sponsors? Why are they donating? And what are the benefits they are expecting from these donations by corporations? One of the great things about, you know, of course, with the Veterinary Nurse Initiative and having sponsors is that they're only going to sponsor if they believe in what we're doing. And so the companies that have uh, provided sponsorship believe this is the right thing and it's right for their organization as well. They also want to help improve this industry and move the veterinary nurses forward and provide better delineation within practices. And so while they are, um, it's wonderful to have them supporting us, it's also because they want to better the profession and better their companies as well. The last question in this group is, and, and I'll, I'll answer this quickly, Heather, but you can expand if we need to. Is the VNI now requiring individual state associations to pay for their own lobbyists or to put the bill for any legislative efforts? And the answer is no. No state veterinary tech association, no state veterinary medical association or VMA are in any manner required to put up the funding for activities that the VNI pursues. We, however, are only involved in state. I had to go. Okay. Sorry, Patricia has to go. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, so no state VMA, no state vet tech association is required or expected to fund our lobbying effort, and they don't. I will say that we are not involved in any state legislature where the state VMA and the state vet tech association uh, don't support the VNI. We only go into states now where both organizations support the VNI. The next question will be, there are a lot of questions about nurses yesterday or the ANA, which is the American Nursing Association. I'm going to ask Ken to, um, to answer this, and there may be some parts I supplement. Ken, first question, who has the VNI been speaking with at the ANA or other representative nursing groups? Um, so our contact at the ANA is Janet Habler, who is from the Governmental Affairs Division of the American Nurses Association. And we've also contacted the National Council of State Boards of Nursing in a general inquiry manner. And I can add that in individual states, we know or we meet with lobbyists for the nursing associations or some of the members. Uh, Heather uh, had a lot of contacts in Tennessee in that respect. So. Uh, they have different names, but that's whoever shows up. Generally, it's been the lobbyists paid for by the state nursing associations that testify and, and introduce themselves and make themselves known. Um, the question was, and I'll, I'll just answer this real quick, Ken, is the VNI team in current discussions with the ANA, um, there's no negotiations going on. They've made their opposition public. And, and, and consistently so, and, there, and there's no door left open for us to negotiate with them. So there's not current discussions. Should they want to talk to 
can Heather uh, nap to leadership? Uh, I know that the answer would be yes. The timeline, Ken began discussions with them. Ken, what year was it that you first reached out to ANA? Uh, Heather and I both reached out in 2016 through emails, telephone conversations. Um, we basically had to explain uh, what our profession looked like in terms of the role that we played in education and all that sort of stuff that uh, is of interest to them to consider um, uh, what's going on. And we reached out to them to uh, really get uh, advice on how to move something like this forward. And then we also definitely let them know that there's a possibility that um, we'll be looking for a title change to nurse and what they thought about it. And so at that point in time, um, she basically said, yeah, well, that sounds like we have similar professions. Um, we'll get you in touch with the, the people in the States when you get to that stage. Uh, and then um, Mark, did you want to like next, next thing that happened was um, right. September of 2017, which was us attending the ANA's uh, state annual stakeholder meeting to explain our thought process, uh, the potential change in title, um, and all that, or sorry, the, the change in title, um, and uh, ask for feedback regarding it. And, and there definitely were um, voices of uh, uh, concern about that for their profession, which, you know, with, with the advocacy organization, they're doing what they're doing, or what, what they're supposed to be doing, so that's uh, perfectly fine. Um, and uh, in November 2017 is when we received a letter from the ANA that um, stated their uh, opposition to it. Uh, they worked hard to protect their title and they felt that the term nursing applies to uh, people who provide nursing care to people only. And, um, and we respectfully disagreed that uh, we felt that the term nursing does apply to all species and that's a role that we do play. And that's uh, kind of where um, okay. I'm at right now. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. And the, la the last question, uh, I'll just answer quickly, then we'll get down to questions regarding NAVTA and some studies. And then Catherine will tell me how we're doing on time. And the last question was, how can NAVTA and the VNI financially compete against the ANA and AVMA, which have much larger constituencies and financial resources to fight the title change and title protection? First of all, we're not competing against the AVMA. They're not opposing this initiative, so there, that, that question assumes something that's simply not the case, so we're not, that's not a fact. Um, as to the ANA, they are, they, are, they are much larger, they have a lot more money. However, what we learned in Ohio, and we passed the House by essentially 70 to 30 or 66 to 28, after lobbying by the nurses, after testimony by the nurses, it's a big state politically, so, we wanted to jump right into the ring, if you will, in a major state and, and be able to have everybody watch that and look at it and, and learn from it. And what we learned was the nurses made it clear their only issue was they feel they own the name. They weren't arguing that anybody goes to the Cleveland Clinic to get a spay and neuter or goes to a local veterinary practice to get their own heart procedures done. So there was no suggestion of confusion, just that they own the name. And Dean Rustin Moore of the Ohio State College of Veterinary Medicine was in the room. He raised his hand and asked to be heard. The committee invited him up to testify right after the nursing lobbyist, and everybody needs to hear this. He volunteered, in his case, he's doctor twice. He volunteered that there are between, I think, nine or 10 names at a minimum in the healthcare world in Ohio that use the name nurse and or use the name doctor, excuse me, and there's no problems. And he mentioned that doctors are known to be maybe a little bit on the arrogant side and they don't seem to have a problem. And he couldn't understand the notion that the word nurse was so different and special and had to be treated in a completely different category, that it was given universal authority over all areas of medical care. And I can tell you that the committee, which voted 14 to one, was not impressed by the argument. And we have consistently found that that simple argument makes the case. So despite the money spent by the nurses, if we get a chance to have a hearing in front of the right committees that, that understand the issues, um, we're gonna be successful and you don't have to match dollar for dollar, which we couldn't do. So I, I think we're gonna be fine there. So let's go to NAPTA questions, I think. Um, if we could, please. Uh, 
And these are for Ken and Ed, and then Heather will come back to you on some questions regarding studies. Catherine, how are we doing on time, please? So right now we've got about, uh, I just do my quick math, 10 more minutes left for us to be at the 50 minute mark. Um, so, and then I've already sent, just so everyone's aware, by the way, I'm Catherine Haskins. I'm the co-founder of the Bridge Club and Brenda's down there. And we realized we didn't introduce who we were. Brenda, shake your hand. So those of you that are hearing from our voices on the chat, you know who uh, is doing that. Uh, and then we have already sent you uh, a summary, uh, not summary, we've literally cut and pasted the questions into a Word document uh, for us to move on to the next section. We'll go as far as we can, and then otherwise we'll take care of them offline. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, na uh, regarding NAVTA specifically, what is NAVTA doing to increase membership support and member retention? Ken and then Ed, if you want to add. Um, we are uh, definitely working on increasing our membership. I think you saw the membership drive go out or the beginnings of the membership drive go out in terms of um, uh, re-application uh, um, to renew their membership and uh, all that sort of stuff going out. Um, we're increasing communication. That's a big focus of ours that uh, throughout the um, time that uh, Kara came on to the presidency, Aaron going into it, and me coming on as president-elect. We're very focused on making sure that uh, all the information that the members need to know are going to be out there. Um, there's uh, all the things that NAFTA has been doing uh, previously, uh, starting from things like uh, putting together the um, National Vet Tech Week. There's a specialty uh, organizations that we support. Uh, there's state associations that we have uh, leadership um, summits with and try to support their associations through the resources that we have. And all that is still there, um, as well as the Vet Nurse Initiative that we're uh, adding on as one of our initiatives uh, along with everything that's going on um, so that uh, we can advocate for the profession at the best we can. And, and so, uh, um, you know, there's a lot coming up and there's a lot going on. And we're, uh, we have our new partnership with the AVMA that allows us full autonomy of the association while having the resources of a membership advocacy organization that's already in place, which will even extend our ability to advocate uh, even better. And so lots of exciting stuff going on. Um, and uh, we um, look forward to continuing having these conversations with you guys. Ed, why don't you take this next one um, and Ken jump in if you need. Uh, how is NAFTA going to protect the title of a registered veterinary nurse? Well, obviously with the, um, the Vet Nurse Initiative moving forward and trying to make this a, a standard title throughout the, the country um, with title protection, um, that's a huge part of it. But the other part of this is as veterinary professionals, veterinary technicians or veterinary nurses, we need to be helping to protect us ourselves. And so really the on the ground efforts of all of our members um, and everyone in the profession to not only be um, educating the public, but also to be educating our coworkers, um, including the veterinarians that we work with, who believe it or not, many times do not understand the differences with titles or title protections. Um, and so it really is all of our jobs to be uh, working on that. So Ken, uh an aspect of that, could you answer, what happened to the program two years ago in which videos and brochures were created to educate the public? Was it funded by NAVTA? Yeah, uh, so um, this is referring to a project that was taken on by the State Representative Committee and it came up um, through discussions with people through the, um, the technician leadership summits that we were holding. And uh, it was a project to try to create a uh, profession promotional video that we could use and share with the state association so that we can promote um, our profession to the public. Um, there was uh, good work that went into it um, through the committee members uh, and um, a plan put in place, a plan that was uh, proposed um, with a certain amount of money that, that was attached to it. Um, the NAFTA board at the time uh, wasn't able to approve the amount that was being asked for. And so it came back to committee to try to adjust it a little bit or make some changes that may be able to um, move that forward in a different kind of way. Uh, and um, it's uh, been in the committee since, I think. Uh, well, one of the, the committee members that was spearheading this for us um, uh, 
did um, resign from the committee uh, in, uh, shortly after that. And so uh, it, there hasn't been a spearheader on that. And we're happy to have somebody pick that back up. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Heather, I'm going to pull you into this next set of questions. Um, and th this was discussed yesterday, but there's a question. NAFTA did a second demographic study at the end of 2016 in the November, December timeframe with specific questions about members' opinions of the VNI. Have the results been made public or published? And if not, when will they be? And I just want to clarify that it was not a second demographic study. It was just a study that followed uh, after we had released information from that 2016 demographic study. So two different uh, studies that were completed. Uh, those studies um, have all been released publicly through our uh, summits that we've done, our leadership summits that we've presented. Uh, we've also presented in webinars. We've also presented in a conference meeting that uh, BMX, WBC, AVMA. Um, we've also presented in, uh, here on the Bridge Club and provided those slides uh, as a follow-up to that presentation that we did. Thank you. Uh, have any state vet tech associations issued statements opposing the vni and if so which ones we've had no opposition sent to us okay and and i may not understand all the acronyms here but you will one of the vni's goals is to standardize credentialing including avma program graduation the current requirements for vts don't require AVMA graduation. Will NAFTA standardize this before asking for further support of the VNI? Well, first of all, the Veterinary Nurse Initiative's goal is as we, you know, as we continue to standardize that credentialing, we don't and can't tell AVMA or the CVTEA what to include in their program curriculum. We can make recommendations, but it's up to them to approve that. So. Um, while we don't have involvement, we do like to at least um, send in opinions for that. Um, but the requirements for the VTS is um, that is something that should be under consideration with the CVTS and the NAFTA board. But I think it would be premature to make changes to the standards until we get those standards in place. So I think that that's a, a future consideration for the CVTS and NAFTA board. Ed, um, as former chair of CVTS, is there anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think you're exactly right there. I think it would be premature at this point where we don't have a standardized credential and in some um, cases in some states don't have any credentialing whatsoever. Um, so um, we need to try to get this taken care of before moving on to, to other things. Thank you. The next set of questions relate to practice model. This was a topic discussed yesterday or model practice acts and uh, both Heather and Ken can, can answer here. Um, is there a copy of the quote standard practice act that will be used? I'm not entirely sure what they mean by standard, nor do I know quite what's meant by will be used as to what states, but uh, I will say first of all to everybody, there is an AAVSB model practice act, there is an AVMA model practice act, I don't know if that's what the person's asking, but Ken or uh, uh, Ed or Heather, do, do you know if there's a standard practice act as it's being asked that can be used or seen? I could probably speak the best of that, so I'll um, answer this one. So uh, I think the person is referring to a uh, model practice act that um, NAFTA may put out uh, to, or the VNI would put out to say, here's our standards. And um, we're uh, currently working with the AABSB uh, to work on the scope of practice aspect of it. and. So it's not finalized yet. Um, and it's also going to be through, because the, the scope of practice part is the most important part of it, um, uh, more, most important, every part of it is important. What I meant to say is that the model, uh, the scope of practice part is the most complicated part of this uh, in that um, we need to be working with uh, the organizations like AVSB to get a good consensus. And through getting your input and the state association's input, the VTS Academy's input, to uh, mold that in the way that um, at least I'd be able to give our input as technicians into how that should 
would look. The goal would be to have a model practice act that um, can be agreed upon by at least for the veterinary uh, technician, veterinary nurse um, language regarding it by the AVMA and the AAVSB, and we're working towards that. The last two minutes, if I have two minutes, I hope, Catherine, I want to give, uh, I want to throw a question to Katie and then have Heather uh, also answer this. Uh, and I and I want to be clear, I'm not asking a question about surveys to debate nurse versus some other name. Um, I'm asking a question to Katie, the, the people that, whether or not they support the VNI, uh, would there be a willingness to work with the VNI, and I'll ask Heather the same question, um, on surveys or outreach related to greater public awareness of the skills and and, and value brought to veterinary care by credentialed veterinary technicians or veterinary nurses, if that's the case, um, or ways to increase public awareness and, and ultimately veterinary utilization um, of credentialed vet techs. So Katie, would you be open to working with NAFTA and or the VNI on those, that type of a survey or outreach? Absolutely, because I think the better information we provide to the uh, public, including, you know, clients as well as veterinary practitioners, the better serve all the technicians' practices and our owners, um, it, that's a win-win situation. So yes, I am more than happy to assist any way I can and um, I'll actually see if I can get a copy of, uh, or have Charlotte send in a PDF of the trifold brochure that she developed uh, with VSPN for client information. Thanks, uh, Heather, same question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, this whole thing is, is circles around education and and, and educating the consumers about what our roles are, but it's not only educating the consumers, it's about us as veterinary nurses or veterinary technicians taking the initiative to, um, to prevent those that are utilizing the title that are not credentialed. And I think we need to own our profession. We need to report those that are using the name unethically to the board so that the board can follow up on those complaints. So yes, I want to create um, further outreach education. I'd love to work with Katie on developing that, um, and um, and and getting our technicians or nurses comfortable with self-reporting. I think that there that there's a lack of confidence there, uh, and we need to build that. Thank you, Heather. Catherine, I believe we have consumed the oxygen. So I, I would like to say the chat's making me want to drink at 1030 in the morning. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, but in a good way, you guys, this is what this is all about. We love the passion. This is a topic we wanted to bring forward. We understand uh, many are confused that there's not the discussion that we typically have at the Bridge Club. But I can honestly tell you, we still have one full page of questions that we've yet to answer in addition to all the ones that are on the chat. So the purpose of today was to get as many of those out as possible as we had uh, put out there and ask for those questions in advance. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who submitted those in advance to us. We are now going to ask um, that we all leave on a high note and everyone raise your glass and thank you, thank absolutely everybody for all your questions. We are going to answer the rest of them. So please note that. So this video will come in two parts. You will get this video that we posted on our social channel and then there'll be a second video that will also be posted on the channel. And we're gonna go ahead because we know everyone's time is of the essence. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and we're gonna move into another room and get that taken care of quickly so that we can post both. I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Thank you everyone for all your questions. Brenda, do you have anything you wanna add? And then we'll do a quick little toast. Yeah, just I mean quickly what, what Catherine said, the important part is to get people sitting across the table from each other and having these kinds of conversations. We're not we're not advocating anybody has to agree with each other, but let's at least open our ears and listen, right? And know we're all working in the best interest of the profession, no matter where you land. So thank you for being here, for being polite, and for, for listening. We really do appreciate that. Thank you, Bridge, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.